How many of you, though, when you were told you had to act like Christ, you said, okay, I thought I was? <laughs> Me. That's kind of the way it works, isn't it? Well, what do they mean then? If, if, if I'm not doing it now, what do they really mean? What does it say? Well, a good preacher will tell you, aren't you reading your scriptures? You should know what it says. Well, that's kind of a harsh way to put it, but that's kind of the attitude we get from preachers sometimes, isn't it? Don't think preachers aren't with that attitude. And sometimes it's not a good one. Not helpful. Well, we're going to try this morning to be helpful rather than condemning. We're going to try and approach it from the standpoint, God says we should be like Christ, but here's what he means. And here's ways we can actually accomplish that. Now, that's presuming that you're not like Christ now. How many of you feel like you're like Christ now already? Now that I've told you you're not. <laughs> I thought that way. See, that's kind of the way we approach it, though, isn't it? By the way, I, I personally think most of us are much more like Christ than what we think we are or that preachers say we are. Because I think often we're, we're judging ourselves by a standard that's awfully high to begin with. I mean, can you, for example, look at Christ lay your life up against his life and say that you, you match up point for point. And in fact, I could even argue that it's difficult to even begin that process. Jesus came down through a miraculous birth. I came down through an earthly birth. I still think I came from heaven, but uh, besides that, it's okay. The reality is our life starts as a natural life. Jesus' life started in a miraculous way. He was 12 years old when he's caught in the temple, talking to the elders of the, uh, of the Jews. When I was 12 years old, I was hoping I, I didn't lose my baseball mitt and could go and play the Little League game. When Jesus was 30 years old, he walks down to the River Jordan, and his cousin, whom he may not have even known, really, to be honest with you, we don't know, points up and says, Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Is that what my cousins called me? Yeah, no, that's not what they called me. They loved me, but that's not what they called me. It's a worldly difference that we have hard time matching up. Okay, well, so when we became a Christian, that changed, didn't it? We were buried in the waters of baptism. We were raised to walk in newness of life. And in so doing, we were transformed. We were changed into a new creation. Actually, we're told it's a new creature. The jokes about a new species aside, the fact is, we are supposed to be a new creation, aren't we? We're supposed to be different than the world around us at that point. Does that always happen instantly? I remember when I was younger, somebody would talk about an alcoholic and say, well, I knew he wouldn't make it. Did you ever hear that? You know, he got baptized, I'm going to quit drinking. Never going to have a problem with that again in my life. What did it take? Five days? Seven? I knew he wouldn't make it. But then the next time he takes a drink, it's two weeks. Or longer even still, or whatever. And eventually, he's no longer doing that. Why? Because something is changing his life. We call it the Holy Spirit. We call it living with God. We're talking about God within us, Jesus within us, if you will. But we don't always know what that experience really means to us. And the problem with many of us is that that happened so long ago that we're not mindful of it anymore. I guess that's the best way to put it. We just don't think of it in those terms anymore. We don't remember how it felt to have a life that wasn't matching up, and we had to change. We don't remember how it felt that we'd hear the preacher preach, and we wouldn't point to somebody else and say, yeah, I'm glad he's here to hear that. Because we were the ones that everybody was pointing at, saying, I'm glad he's here to hear that. We don't remember what that was like, because we think we don't need it anymore. Yeah, it's a little harsh, I know. Some of you guys need it. Let me ask you, how many of you think you need it still? Oh, that's wonderful. Wonderful. We need it still. And by the way, that's true of all of us, preachers, elders, deacons. It doesn't make any difference who we are. New converts. Chris is right down here with Jill. Chris, uh, what's it been, a month now? Praise God. He quit drinking immediately, didn't you? (laughs) No, never mind. 
I don't know what his issues were. That's between him and God, isn't it? Or Jill and God. <clears throat> the fact is, we need it. And as a result of that, we need to then begin the process by which we conform to the image of God's Son. Now, conformed is a good word because in Romans chapter 12, he says, I beseech you, therefore, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as living sacrifices, which is your spiritual service. Now, if we look at that, verse 2 goes on from there. He says, don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind and the gift of the Holy Spirit. If we understand that transformation as opposed to confirmation, confirmation means we look just like it. We act just like it. We have that essence like it. Romans chapter 12, verse 2 then, don't conform to the world. So if we did nothing else in conforming to Christ, just quit conforming to the world, that would be a major step forward, wouldn't it? That would be the beginning of the process. The transformation is that process, though, that occurs in the Spirit when we are converted and that spirit in us right now. But let's continue on with this idea. To become like him, we should become centered on him. Another word for centered might be focused. How many of you are self-centered? Eh, a couple of you raised your hand. The rest of you are not honest, but that's okay. We understand that. We are self-centered by definition, aren't we? The psychologists even go so far as to say that. Now, when it becomes clinical, in other words, when we are so self-centered that it becomes uh, pathological. When it becomes so self-centered that it becomes, well, they have a term for it in their diagnostics manual. They call it narcissism. I don't think any of us in here are narcissistic. So centered on ourselves that we don't even realize that that's a human being standing in front of us. That that's just a thing, not a human. That we can treat that person any way we want to because he's not a person to us. I have feelings, but he doesn't. That's narcissistic. We used to call it a couple of other names like uh, psychopath and things like that. We get things that maybe something goes wrong and they shoot a bunch of people. Why? Because they weren't killing people. They were just shooting things. It's a pathological disease at that point. We look at the world around us and we see the self-centeredness of the world around us and we say, well, doesn't that define most of them? Well, maybe it does. But who's the great physician if that's the case? Who's the great healer if that's the case? I can't heal him. You can't heal him. I guarantee you the psychologist can't heal him. But Christ is the great physician, isn't he? Let's conform to his image. Let's develop his priorities. All right, in Romans chapter, I mean Psalms chapter 62. Trust in him at all times. I'm going to go this route because in my opinion, the issue begins with trust. Uh, we would use a different word today. We don't like to use the word trust. We like to use the word depend. Um, depend on whom? I depend on my wife for certain things. I depend on my relationship with my brethren here at the church. I depend on God first and foremost. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a hiding place for us. Surely the sons of men are vanity, the sons of men are a lie. They go up in the scales, they are altogether lighter than vanity. Trust not in oppression, become not vain in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart on them. God has spoken once, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God. Also to you, O Jehovah, belongs mercy, for you give to every man according to his work. We need to trust God because he is the power. He is also the merciful God. Where do you get mercy if, if, you get, if you don't get it from God? Do you get it from any other source? We try to act merciful sometimes, but that's not where it comes from, is it? And in fact, we could go so far as to quote the scripture that talks about love. Well, we can love each other. Yeah, but we love because God first loved us, right? We have to start with God. It belongs to God first, power. We have to recognize that Jesus, when he came here, was a particular type of lifestyle that he lived. Here's a couple of suggestions I'm just throwing out there. Uh, he wasn't uh, self-centered. We talked about that. He wasn't me-centered. He wasn't easily uh, uh, changed from his heaven orientation either. We see him going up on the mountain to pray. We see him going out into the wilderness to pray. We see him going to pray all the time. Jesus, you're monotonous. You're going to pray again. Yes, I am. I'm going to go talk to my father. 
in heaven. In the bulletin, there's a little compass on one of the pages, and it says, how are you oriented? And in there, there is a specific suggestion that we need to be Christ-oriented. Heaven-oriented, yes. God-oriented, yes. But we're really talking about Christ-oriented. So what's this type of lifestyle we're supposed to live? How about this one? Jesus talks about those of the world. He says, the rulers of the nation exercise dominion over the uh, people. They who are great exercise authority over them. However... It shall not be so among you. I want to be related to God. It shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to be great among you, let him be your servant. Whoever desires to be chief among you, let him be your servant. Friends, uh, I'm going to use this as an example. Please understand, I'm just using it as an example out of context. 1 Timothy chapter 3, the Apostle Paul writing to Timothy through the Holy Spirit says that if someone desires to become a bishop, he desires a good work. Desires. Based on this passage, I'm somewhat of the idea that if a person desires a position that we consider a ruling position, which, by the way, that may be our problem, because I mean about what God thinks. But if he desires it, that should disqualify him automatically. Now, you may not have heard that before, and I'm not telling you it actually means that, but I'm telling you that if the person really is wanting it for the power, he's disqualified. If he's wanting it because it's an opportunity to serve, then he's not disqualified. Does that make sense to you? God doesn't want us to rule over each other. He doesn't want us to take the authority over others. We're supposed to serve. Do you remember there at the end when he washes his disciples' feet? It's an incredible story. When he gets through, he says, If I serve you in this manner, then you go out and serve in this manner also. You go out and do likewise. We miss the point a lot, don't we? We miss the point sometimes when we don't realize that God intended for us to be servants. We're not supposed to be rulers. We're not supposed to lord it over anybody. And that's true in your families as well. We like to point out that Jesus was compassionate. Let's take a look at this. Matthew chapter 14, Jesus went out and saw a great crowd. He was moved with compassion towards them. And he healed their sick. We can deal with that, except we don't have the miraculous healing in our hands right now. However, I suggest to you we really do. It's just not in the manner that he had it. We can pray for the sick. The elders are told to be called and be ready to anoint them with oil and pray for them. So their sins can be forgiven and they can be healed. But Jesus' compassion moved him to heal them. Did he come to heal all the sick in the world? No. Did he come to feed all the hungry in the world? No, but he was moved with compassion to feed them and to heal them occasionally, wasn't he? He was moved with compassion, though, all the time. How about uh, Mark chapter 6? He stepped out of the boat and saw a large crowd waiting and felt sorry for them. That, again, is another one of those felt compassion for them, actually. Because they were like sheep without a shepherd to care for them. And what he did was to teach them. That's what a shepherd does, isn't it? A shepherd teaches What are we supposed to be doing then? We're be compassionate, teach, help them with their physical needs, food, healing, whatever it is may be, as best we can, but also to teach. And by the way, a teacher learns more than the student, doesn't he? You will learn more to be like Christ when you're trying to teach somebody else to be like Christ than they will learn from you. Not because you're a bad teacher, it's just the way teaching works, the way God made us. We learn and we put it in our lives as well. Jesus called him a servant. We should be one too. How many of you in here can call yourself a servant? B, raise your hand. Don't just sit there and hold your hand. Very good. Very good. See, we can be judgmental. We know who are servants out there and who aren't. And I don't care whether you think you are or not. God knows who you are. And I'm not pointing to me because I'm God. I'm pointing to me because we can recognize it. A servant heart is a servant heart, isn't it? And when someone's a servant heart, you'll see Christ in their lives. 